You're listening to Bible Truth Feed, a podcast by Christadelphianvideo.org for Christadelphians and all those seeking the truth about the Bible message. Join us now as we present our latest episode. So last week we looked at Cornelius from the angle of the people involved, principally these two men, Peter and Cornelius. And we found out they both had a journey to go on. They had to learn things. Cornelius' case, things for salvation. In Peter's case, things about God's purpose. And tonight we want to take sort of the macro view with our topic, God invites all people to his family. And think about how dramatic this event was in the story of the book of Acts. Now, if you go to Caesarea today, you find along that sea coast some pretty interesting sort of ruins under the waves these days. But you can see quite a bit of the ancient city of Caesarea. And some of you have been there and seen the preserved aqueduct and all the rest of it. But... This seems to be an unlikely place for the gospel to take root because it was the centre of Roman governance and people didn't really like the Romans and didn't want to be there. But it was a city in which God worked to bring people to salvation to be part of his family. So over four days, God worked in the lives of these two men through two visions that they both had through the work of the angels intervening to bring these men together and for Cornelius to be baptised. And we get that crowning point at the end of Acts 10 that Cornelius and all his house are baptised. How happy would Peter have been? And then in chapter 11, he goes up the hill, mountain, to Jerusalem and when he gets home to Jerusalem these Jews come out and they say to him in verse 3 you went into uncircumcised men and you ate with them Peter you're a shocker how could you have done that that is disgraceful and here's Peter come back to Jerusalem thinking oh I'm so excited all these people were baptised And what's the response of his Jewish brethren, or a small group of them, the circumcision group? They say, Peter, that's not on. And and he has to go through and explain to them why it was absolutely right in the sight of God. Now, why it was right goes back to the mission of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to take you back to Matthew 16. If you're listening to Tim on Sunday night, you know all about this. But for those who missed his engrossing program, I'll fill you in. So, Jesus was going up north. He is finding himself slowly being rejected by the people of Israel. He turned the... the, the um, loaves into a multitude of bread and fed the 5,000, but there's a hardening of attitudes against Jesus. So he's going up into the mountains to the northeast of Israel, to the area of Lebanon, particularly Mount Hermon, at a place called Banis, which is a really lovely spot to go if you ever get to Israel, where the water just gushes out of the mountain from the snows of Lebanon. And he's heading up there and he's talking to his disciples In verse 13, he comes to the region of Caesarea Philippi, another Caesarea, and he's asking his disciples, who do people say that I, the Son of Man, am? He uses a particular title, which is found in Psalm 8. It's the title of the one who's going to have the dominion, the dominion, the victory over sin. And they answered him, well, verse 14, some of you say, some say people think you're John the Baptist, risen from the dead, like Herod. Uh, some people think you're Elijah. And it was John the Baptist, really, that was like Elijah. Others think you're like Jeremiah. Curious choice. Jeremiah is always the, 
the weeping prophet, the prophet of doom, but some thought he was him, or maybe one of the other prophets. Well, after all this speculation, Jesus says to his disciples in verse 15, well, who do you, you think I am? And Peter said in verse 16, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Now, it wasn't the first time anyone had called Jesus the Christ. In John chapter 1, at the very start of his ministry, Peter's brother Andrew says, You are the Christ. In John chapter 6, after the feeding of the 5,000, Peter says, You are the Christ. But this is really special to the Lord Jesus Christ. The pressure is coming on, people are turning away from him, the hatred is increasing. And in the midst of all that antagonism, Peter can say with absolute confidence, you are the Messiah of the Old Testament, the anointed one who is anointed to be the king, the prophet and the priest. And Jesus responded very warmly to Peter's strong conviction that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. He says to him in verse 17, Blessed are you, Simon, bar Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Now, last Wednesday night, Tim put up at the end something you had no time to read, which was a comparison between Simon Peter and Jonah. Right? And now we, of course, told here that Peter was the son of Jonah. His father's name was, was Jonah. Simon bar Jonah. And in Acts 10, he has a Jonah-like experience. Will he preach to the Gentiles or not? And he says to him, Simon, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. Verse 17, so... You don't come to this realisation of who Jesus is just out of your own mind. You don't pluck it out of the air. It's not a human understanding. It has come from my Father who is in heaven. You have absorbed the Father's teaching. You understand, I am the Messiah, the Son of God. And then he says to him in verse 18, I say to you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my congregation of believers, and the gates of Hades, the grave, will not prevail against it. Now, on Sunday night, did anyone listen to Tim? What did Tim reckon that the rock was on which the believers will be built? Just testing whether anyone listened to Tim, apart from me. Well, Tim suggested that the rock was Peter's statement of belief, which came from Peter. It's not just Peter the man, it's Peter and his conviction. And on that belief that Jesus is the Messiah, the believers will be built. And then he says in verse 19, And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. I'm going to give you some keys, Peter, and you are going to open the kingdom of heaven. And you will also have a power to bind on earth when you take some binding action or loosing action. Whatever decisions you make, Peter, will be respected in heaven. So he gives them some keys. And I've been to the Vatican and seen some keys sort of emblazoned in flowers in one of the gardens. But it's not really about that. It was about keys to open the way into the kingdom of heaven. Now, in our Acts study this year, we have actually seen Peter using those keys. In Acts chapter 2, he got his key and he opened a door, the door for the Jews to come into the kingdom of heaven. And it was based on this exact belief that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. 
But he had another key. There was another door to open. And that was the door that we looked at last week. He opened the door of the way to the kingdom for the Gentiles. Now you might say, hadn't any Gentiles been baptised before this time, before Cornelius, his family? Who had been baptised? Who was a Gentile? Ethiopian eunuch, who presumably was quite a dark black man coming from Ethiopia. He was a very rich man, but he had been baptised by Philip. Any others? In the Gospels, before Cornelius? Don't know. But there was obviously people in Rome in, in Acts chapter 2 who came from Rome and Iran and all those places and they were probably not all Jews. Some of them were Jewish proselytes. So what was the difference? Nobody complained when Philip baptised the Ethiopian eunuch. Why are they complaining, more than complaining, angry with the conversion of Cornelius? What upset them so much? Well, it's back in Acts chapter 11 and verse 3. You went in to uncircumcised men and ate with them. The Ethiopian eunuch and others who'd been baptised were what was called proselytes. They were Gentiles who had entered the Jewish faith. And the men would have practised circumcision, as Jews did. And they would have agreed to do all the law of Moses. But Cornelius had not done that. He was a Gentile being accepted by grace into Jesus Christ. But he had not conformed to all the rules and regulations of the law of Moses. And the principal one they made most focus on was circumcision. So it was a rather abrupt and sudden change and they couldn't cope with this. Now, this is a pivotal point in the book of Acts because from this point, the Apostle Paul goes out and preaches to the Gentiles. and He goes right throughout the world, we think right across to Spain, teaching to Gentiles. And it starts here in Acts chapter 10 and 11. Because what happens here is that God shows that all men and women, irrespective of nation, background, can be baptised and be part of his family. So one of the first things I think about was why was Peter chosen? Wasn't there any other disciples living in Caesarea? Yes, we know at least one. He just lived down the road in Joppa. So I'm, yeah, yeah, Joppa is a little bit further down the road. Yeah. Acts eight verse forty. What does that say, Tim? Okay, Philip preached in all the cities, and he came to Caesarea. And we know he's settled there because later in Acts, he's got a wife and daughters, and they're living in Caesarea. So Philip is there, right? Who else could have talked to Cornelius? Well, in chapter 9, the apostle Paul passed through, right? And uh, he was on his way, and he went off to his hometown. So he passed through this place as well. So why Peter? Why couldn't Philip done it? Why couldn't Paul do it? Why did God choose Peter to make this incredible change? The gospel was going to the Gentiles. Aaron.
sounds a fantastic answer to me. Make you fishers of men, all right? So Peter was the lead fisherman. So that's one answer. Aaron's answer, he was a passionate man and it, he could convince people that this was right, you know? If you sent Philip, they'd say, oh, well, he was just an evangelist. Abby? Lily? He was most against the Gentiles? Yeah, he was one of those who was most against the Gentiles. So if you could convince him, you could convince the others. You ever read, you did Acts 7 just a few weeks ago, you read Stephen's speech. Why didn't one of the 12 apostles give that speech? Why did Stephen, who wasn't even one of the 12, get up and give it? Because the other tw- the 12 did not understand that speech. They didn't get it, right? Stephen was way ahead of them because they were stuck in this mould that only the Jews could be saved. And Stephen knew that wasn't right. So here's Cornelius. He's a good man. And we explained last week he needed cleansing. And he had to find the true cleansing in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we have various phrases. Chapter 10, verse 32. Cornelius is told that he has to send for Peter. And when he comes, he will speak to you. So you need to hear some words. In the reading tonight, chapter 11, verse 14. He will tell you words by which you and all your household will be saved. And so in verse 15, Peter began to speak. So he was a really good chap. He was generous. He prayed to God. He feared God. He was devout. He he had all these attributes, but he hadn't been cleansed yet. He needed his sins washed away. And this is a lesson for all of us. doesn't matter how kind we are, how gracious we are, how good things we do, unless we have our sins washed away, we cannot stand before God. Now, what did he tell him? He said, send for Peter, he's going to tell you words by which you can be saved. Well, what did Peter talk to him about? Well, Tim passed over this quite quickly last week, and it was in verse 37 to 43 of chapter 9. These were the words. And he says, look, Cornelius, you know that Jesus of Nazareth walked around the land and you know the sorts of things he talked about from Galilee and throughout the land of Israel. You're sitting down here on the coast, nice place, Caesarea, pretty good weather, probably pretty similar to Adelaide but a bit warmer and fine place, pretty hot in summer, nice place to be. And, and, and even here in, in Caesarea, you would have heard this message of Jesus Christ. And you would have heard in verse 38 how God gave him his special powers. And in verse 38, Jesus went about doing good. Want well, to know what Jesus' life was about? It was about doing good. He concentrated on doing good. You know, the Pharisees and Sadducees sit in Jerusalem, scowling at all the people. Jesus didn't do that. He walked right around the nation doing good and healing people who had mental illness. And the end of verse 38, God was with him. He's a very special man. And he said, look, Cornelius, you and I, verse 39, I think the we is all of them, We are witnesses of all things which Jesus did in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, even in their capital, against all the hatred. And they killed him. They hung Jesus on a tree. The great ignominy of their law. But, verse 40, God raised him up on the third day and showed him openly. Could anyone doubt that Jesus was raised from the dead? No. Lots of people saw him. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, 500 people saw him at once. And then he told him, um, and and verse 41, people ate and drank with him. People sat down and had a meal with the risen Lord 
They knew he was real. He wasn't some ghost or apparition. And verse 42, he commanded us, Peter, to preach to the people. He was a special person chosen to be one of those fishers and to testify that it was he, Jesus, who was ordained by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. Not only was Christ resurrected, but all his faithful followers can be resurrected and Christ will judge them. Verse 43, this is not a new idea, Cornelius. This is in the Hebrew Bible. Cornelius, you know about the Jews. You've helped them build a synagogue. You you are a man who has some understanding of the Jewish faith. This is throughout all the Old Testament scriptures. And the crux of it in verse 43, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. What you desperately need, Cornelius, is your sins forgiven. Now, in the course of his discussion, uh, Peter makes a point in verse 35 about the quality of the person who God works with. We know that that Cornelius listened to this talk that Peter gave and he absorbed it and he agreed with it and he is willing to be baptised into the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of his sins. And that is because he was a man who met the criteria of verse 35. So Peter says to him, In verse 34, God shows no partiality. God treats all men and women equally. Right? There's not different layers. Verse 28, he says, I used to think that it was not lawful for a Jew to keep company with one of another nation. Right? But I know that God doesn't work that way. I'm learning my lesson. Verse 35. In every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. So just two criteria for salvation. To fear God and to work righteousness. And wherever the apostles went, they told people to fear God and work righteousness. I have two quotations there you might like to note down. One from Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12, where Moses, considered the great father of the Jewish people, says, Fear God and obey his statutes. Do what is right before him. Fear God and do what is right. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13, 13, a very well-known passage. Hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole person. If you want to be a complete person, this is what you do. Fear God and work righteousness. Keep his commandments. Now, they're in that order because fearing God comes first. We get a right attitude to God. We realise that he is the powerful, awesome majesty of the heavens and we are just lumps of flesh. And when we enter his presence, we are entering the presence of the great king of the universe. And we realise how great he is, how great his purpose is, how great his love is, and we fear before him. And it actually uses the word in the Old Testament, we tremble at his word. We have great honour and respect for this God. And then, because we have such respect and awe for this God, we work righteousness. Now, Cornelius was on that road. He he did have a fear of God. He was willing to do God's commandments. And so he was the sort of person that God was looking for. But the Jews didn't believe this. They thought there was partiality with God. So, in my King James Bible, it uses the term respect of persons. 
This term is, this word is used in the Greek language about six times. And it's about accepting someone's face. That's what it literally means in the Greek. So you see this little boy here, and you look at this kid, and you say, oh, well, how would you describe this little face? Pete? He's a cute kid. You reckon he's a nice kid? Oh, yeah, I reckon he's a nice kid. So we're just looking at a face, right? I could show you some cute photos of some of my grandchildren, but it doesn't mean that they're necessarily good kids, does it? You know? I can tell you a bit about their personality. but Because we're human, so we respect the face, right? We, we accept people for things other than who they are. So... On what basis did people show partiality in Bible times? What, what's some of the things they're warned against? They prefer this person over that person. Well dressed people over. Well dressed people, particularly wealthy people. Yeah, particularly James chapter two. Very wealthy person comes in in his gold and his expensive outfit and he's very wealthy and the poor people defer to him. So wealth is very definitely one. Not the most common, but wisdom in this world, level of education, expert knowledge. Yeah, it happens in the Bible. I think it still happens today. Personal health. Hadn't thought of that one, but it's probably true. Yeah, if somebody had, well, either they were deformed or something, you, you, you say, oh. Yeah, Jesus is presented as a deformed man in Isaiah 53, isn't it? And none of us want to be near him. Yeah? Still not the most common two. Overly religious? Yep. Definitely. And... Um, it's on my list. Okay. So the most common one was race. Yeah? Jewish people over non-Jewish. It's the most common way. And right through the law of Moses, Moses says, look after the stranger. You were strangers once upon a time in the land of Egypt, so look after these different races coming through. Any other basis? Riches. So I've got race, wealth, slash class is very common throughout the Bible, right? Power, yeah? Respect people who've got power and you look down on the widow who's got nobody to defend her, yeah? And God says, well, I look after the widow even if you don't look after the widow. Righteousness, I think that was your point, Shim, you know, to see people that... The Pharisees and Sadducees put on this aura of righteousness and everyone bowed and respected them, even though they had no righteousness at all. Education, I think was Michelle's point, or titles or whatever, can be broadly any sort of titles or recognition we have. What about personality? Who do you rather go and talk to? Someone who's an extrovert and got a good sense of humour, or a timid person who sits in the back row. Yeah? We do discriminate based on personality. It's, it's, it's really obvious at times. Right? And it was Peter himself who later wrote to his brothers and sisters and said, don't show respect to persons. Jesus Christ died for us all. It doesn't matter if you got white skin or purple skin or you're incredibly wealthy, all, all this stuff is irrelevant. All that matters is that you fear God and work righteousness. Now this teaching is right through the Old Testament. It, it wasn't some new theory that had just been invented. The Old Testament's full of God's work with the Gentiles. Okay, the Gentiles are going to accept the hope of Israel. It says it time and time again, particularly in the prophet Isaiah and during his ministry. 
Jesus quoted from these prophets to say, yes, the Gentiles do have a hope. But, you know, one thing I find quite incredible is that Peter himself used a verse in Acts chapter 2 when he opened the door to the Jews... He quotes a long section from the prophet Joel from verse 16 to 21 and he finishes up in verse 21. It shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The end of Joel chapter 2. And here is this word, whoever calls. Did Peter really believe that at this stage? No. No. He was going to find out that's what God really meant in that passage. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Right? It doesn't matter age, gender, race, wealth, class, power, education. All of these things are irrelevant. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And this word, whoever is picked up many times in the New Testament. It's not exclusive. It's open to anyone who fears God and works righteousness. So it's open to us tonight. Anybody who wants to believe, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And in Acts chapter 11, which we read tonight, the Jews had to understand... what had happened to Peter. And he told them the whole story. And, you know, when he went to see Cornelius, he took six witnesses with him. And they could all stand there and say, Peter is telling the truth. He's not making this up. And he tells them the whole story. Verse 12 of Acts 11, go with them, nothing doubting. Don't be troubled, Peter. This is my purpose. This is what I want. And they came to the house, and verse 12, six brethren accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. And he told them, in verse 15, how the Holy Spirit had come upon them, just as it happened at the first. Verse 17, here's my logic, says Peter. If the Holy Spirit had been given to them, to those people, Cornelius' family, as to us, when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ... Who was I that I could withstand God? Look, don't get upset, Jews. This is God's work. He is bringing many people to salvation. But as we keep going in the story of Acts, we find many people still struggling with this idea. You do not have to keep the Jewish law. You have to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. I'm talking to my friend in Beijing this morning for two hours and she says, you don't know, I can talk about her because you don't meet her and vice versa. She says, yeah, Bruce, I feel a complete failure. I've been studying the Bible for five years and last week, this person got stroppy with me and I lost it. And I got furious with them and says, what a failure I am. I, I'm not, I can't follow Jesus because I completely failed. I said, well, you didn't fail because you knew you'd done the wrong thing. And we're all failures, I said to her. We all fall short. And yeah, one of the verses I went to her, it's the verse I want to take you to at the end of our night here, is Galatians chapter 2. I said, think of the Apostle Peter in Galatians 2. He's a mature man in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is a leader of the brothers and sisters. He's called in this chapter one of the pillars who held up the house of God. And verse 11, Paul said, Peter came to Antioch 
I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. Okay? Here's a modern colloquialism. He shirt fronted him. Peter, you're doing the wrong thing. I don't think he shook him. <laughs> he, says, he stood him to the face and said, Peter, this is wrong. Well, what was wrong? We're told there in verse 12. He used to eat with the Gentiles. He used to eat with the Gentiles. But men came from James. He withdrew and separated himself. What was the whole issue in Acts 11 verse 3? Peter, you shouldn't eat with Gentiles. And Peter said, yes, I should. They're fellow inheritors of God's kingdom. And what does he do under pressure? He stops eating with the Gentiles and he goes over to the Jewish table. And Paul says to him, Peter, is this so ingrained in you? Can't you change? This is just plain wrong. And he goes on to say, um, verse 13, and the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away. Verse 14, When I saw they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, If you are a Jew, live in the manner of Gentiles and not as the Jews, why are you trying to compel or force the Gentiles to live as Jews? So years later, he still hadn't learnt the lesson. Everybody can be in God's family. How did the Jews get such a weird idea that only they were in God's family? Well, there were Old Testament passages. You might like to note down Amos chapter 3 and verse 3. You have I chosen, said God, of all the families of the earth, of all the families I chose you Jews. And the Jews said, Wow, aren't we good? We're the only family God wanted. But if you turn over to the next book of the Bible, Ephesians chapter 3, we find that no longer applies. You and me are all part of this new family. And in Ephesians 3, 14, as Paul discusses the way Gentiles are now part of the hope, he says, look, I am so happy that the Gentiles have come to the hope. For this reason, I bow my knee to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and in earth is named. Do you think of that? We're part of a family. A family not only on earth, but in heaven. The angels are in our family. We're in their family. It would be better to say, wouldn't it? We are in their family, this great family in heaven and earth. And the whole family is named on the Father, the head of the family. And we're all modelling our behaviour on him. And, and, and what will he do for us? Verse 16, this father of this family generously gives to all his children. What does he give us? Strength, verse 16. Strength in the inner person to be different people and that Christ might dwell in your hearts, verse 17, through faith. We'll become different people because we're part of a different family and we're listening to the father of the family who's giving us sound guidance. And so as I hung up my Zoom call today, I said to my friend in Beijing, Look, we're all failures, but God loves us and he wants us. If we had thought we were successes, he couldn't deal with us. But as long as we all know we're failures and that he can make something out of us, we will all find a place in that glorious kingdom. And I hope all of us can humble ourselves. We all can humble ourselves to enter this family and have a hope of eternal life.
Thank you for joining us. We hope you found the episode helpful. Don't forget, most of these episodes are also available as videos on our video channel, cdvideo.org. So head over and take a look. If you have any comments or questions or suggestions, please get in touch or leave us a voice message. We love to hear your feedback. You can email us at bt f at cdvideo.org If you enjoyed the episode, then please share it with others. Until next time, may God bless you in your studies and your walk towards God's kingdom. Amen.